just to start off, I'd be really keen to understand what changes you've seen over the last five to 10 years when it comes to site sheds. So looking back five to 10 years, how are things different now? What have you seen change? I guess the biggest thing that I'm seeing is just the amount of staff on sites. Yep. Um, the, the change in the, the operation of the sites and how that's all working together. Um, so, you know, the amount of large complexing that's going on and the workers there and their facilities that are required are just growing as the infrastructure grows. Yep. Um, that, that's the biggest part for me that's coming through. Yeah. How does that impact on the facilities that are being provided or the, I guess, the end result environmentally or socially or, or economically? The, well, the facilities are becoming a, a workplace. Uh, yep. It's another home almost, given the amount of yep. time that people are spending at those locations. But it's just about uh, improving the um, work, I'm not sure what the term is, but the, the workability on site, just the amenities for the staff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just growing substantially. Yeah. From, from our side of things with, the, with our sheds, we, we've got quite a range of sheds over the years. Um, you know, sheds don't disappear overnight. You manufacture them, you're using them on multiple sites. So we've had a lot of um, change over, over the time as uh, different builders have taken different approaches in terms of how they approach sustainability or site requirements. And that, that's always been a difference in, in the market. Um, some of that competitively, um, others it's just about the project manager's approach to the sites and how they work that. Gotcha, thank you. Anthony, what changes have you seen over the last five to 10 years? I think there's a few factors there. The first one is uh, maybe just looking at the industry dynamics. Yep. Um, you know, it's very obvious that uh, five years ago, um, everyone was busy. There was strong activity in mining. There was, there was a lot of, I guess, commercial incentive for businesses like ours to invest in fleet. Mm -hmm. And we'd also just had the change in the energy efficiency codes, oh, yeah. um, which, which really drove a, a significant change in the way we, we designed buildings and built them. So I think there were a few com uh, combinations there. What I'd say that I've seen in, in, in the last maybe three or four years is, is that we've seen a difference from the mining sector to what we've seen in the construction sector. So on the mining sites, um, they've been, uh, the facilities there, the, we were talking about workforce accommodation and the like, um, we've, <coughs> we've been held to a standard and created a standard, I think that's, that's a lot higher in terms of sustainability because it has been something that's one important to the customer, but second that, that they get and, and, and pay for. I think that that's one. So I guess the certainty knowing that that's what the customer wants and will do has encouraged us to invest in those sorts of products. I think what we've seen in the construction sector to be fair is, is uncertainty, lack of coordination. And that was where my question came from. We, we, see, we see tenders and specifications with the greatest intent of the world. And then what we see executed is just completely different. And it doesn't give us any confidence at all mm -hmm. to invest in a product because, as you mentioned, these buildings last 20 years. Yep. You know, we can't build for three or five years. So, so to have the confidence that, that that's what everyone's going to do, that it aligns with the building code, that, that people actually value it enough to pay for it is there. But we have seen selected examples where, where those um, have been upheld. And, and I think the industry has moved to a point where we've included a lot of these items where, where it's valuable to a customer, but it's hard to do it across the board. I understand that they're different sectors and they go through booms and busts, but why is mining and construction being so different? I think it's the money in mining. It's not as competitive as construction, to be honest. I mean, construction has got to be one of the most competitive activities in the world. I think you guys saving half a percent on, on everything mounts up to a lot of money, whereas in the mining days, um, it was quite ridiculous in a way, but it was got to a point where uh, you'd agree a contract after nine months of negotiations, and the next day someone would say, right, I need that done a month quicker, how much will it cost? And you throw a stupid number at it and they accept it because there was just a lot of margin and a lot of money in the sector. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> so Darren, five to 10 years past, looking five to 10 years ahead, how do you think things are going to be changing? So how is your business evolving over the next five to 10 years? I guess like we're here talking about sustainability, obviously. Um, the business has been implementing um, improvements as they become cost effective yep. and the customers are willing to pay. So that, that's how we've approached it. So you're seeing, seeing uh, increases in new installations, um, but retrofitting fleets, you know, where it gets a lot harder. Yep. Going back and, and making changes in existing fleet 
And I, I don't think we always consider the impact of that on the whole economy of things from a manufacturer's point of view or from a hire's point of view, I should say. That has a, a major impact uh, going back through. We can't just put those buildings aside and not do anything with them. Yeah. Uh, even the retrofitting of them to go through and get those up to speed, just the, the, the waste that goes through that as well. Um, and I think um, Anthony touched on it, just the that, that cost-benefit ratio between the two. But I, I see things continuing on, though, so I, I see that changing and progressing as we're going through. It's just the pace at which it needs to happen that, that I think needs to be balanced out. Yeah. Where have the drivers for these changes come from? So I, I'm sure there have been different things requested over time, but where, where, what are the drivers? Where have they come from? Yeah, um, I'm finding it's coming from the, the government requirements and the and a lot of the work being done by the environmental people in, in the room here. Um, yep. like we talk about uh, Len Lease and the work we've done there, but it's it's just cr um, building that environment for the staff. That's what's driving it, and you know we see value in that. It's just how we get to it. Yeah. You mentioned retrofitting and retrofitting of older stock. Yeah. What's harder about it? I mean, I can imagine what yeah. would be difficult, but what makes it harder? It's the construction of the buildings. Um, mm -hmm. To get the, the ratings that have been noted here, it, it's uh, our walls are only 75 mil wide. To get up to the insulation that we're required here, yep. the cost is just enormous. So, and then going back and retrofitting those buildings, uh, I just don't see that cost benefit for Coates Hire or the customer at the moment. Okay. Um, and Anthony, uh, looking ahead, yeah. uh, five to 10 years, how do you see your market changing, your products changing? How do you think things are gonna be different? I think it's inevitable that, it, that the, the quality and the standard is going to improve, and I think that's fantastic. So, so we sit here fully supportive of what the ACA is doing. I, I think you guys taking the leadership on this is, is essential. So I think as a starting point, that's fantastic. You, you talk about a journey, and, and it kind of feels a little bit to us like we've been given a conclusion uh, as opposed to starting the journey. And I think if you look at the journey going in the next 10 years, I, I think we'll be looking back in 10 years' times with with a far superior outcomes. When I look at our, from an OSCO point of view, our sister companies that operate in Europe, I mean, their facilities are already at those sorts of levels and standards. I mean, there are some di differences where they've got posts in between and we'll, we'll have to work out how, how we manage those things. But I, I think it'll be a lot better. Um, just to pick up on the point of, of the retrofitting, I think um, our industry association actually represents the higher companies. And, and one of the biggest challenges we have is that we're seeing the changes are actually being driven through legislation mostly. It's not often coming from industry creating a singular voice about something. It's normally around legislation or a risk management against some terrible thing, which, which normally creates the, these issues. And uh, one of the issues we have is that whole retrofit piece is, yeah, you, you build buildings to last for 20 years, and then legislation changed tomorrow, which says, look, that's not viable anymore. And you say, well, look at the the embedded energy cost in that building and the cost of getting rid of that is nowhere near as good as, as what you're trying to achieve. So I think what we get is you get this, this polarization effect mm -hmm. where you're looking at one or the other, not the holistic view. But I, I think if this is the start of where we're going, I think the outcome in 10 years' time will be fantastic. But I agree that the timing and the, the way you phase it in has to be done in a way where one you get the outcome you're looking for, but secondly, you, you actually protect your suppliers because the cold reality is there must be, I don't know the number and we should know, but it's probably in excess of 50,000 modular buildings out there in the market that have cost billions of dollars. A change like this can put us out of business overnight, and I don't think that's the intent. Well, I certainly yeah. hope it's not. <laughs> but, but those are the, the competing things we, we've got to come across. But, but certainly from an industry point of view, um, we, we support the objectives of the sustainable and cost-effective part. We just don't think you've got the answer just yet that that's workable. But certainly I think there's a phasing where we could get a, a long way quickly and then some of the harder ones, it's like, okay, that's not going to work. But, but I've got another point in there, which is we talk about the walls. So the walls is the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Getting the, the R rating on the walls is, is practically not possible in, in an economic sense. One of the challenges we face is that we've thought of 20 ways of trying to do it which aren't cost effective. But working with people like yourselves, you might actually help us come up with a solution which is. And I think that's the, 
Um, the inclusion you talked about, which we haven't seen, or the yeah. collaboration around, okay, how do you actually do this? Yeah. So we'd love to be involved with, with organizations saying, okay, well, let's actually see what your issue is and see how we can actually get to, to what you're trying to achieve. So I think the, the evolution will, will happen and be there, and uh, yeah, we just hope it's a collaborative approach. In a way, I just uh, one last question, sure. uh, which in a way you've half answered okay. yourself. Um, my experience over the years has been with the Green Building Council, uh, as Joe has, and certainly with Green Star, uh, setting benchmarks, which are quite a way above industry standard, or in fact above regulation, has reacted in, it has created reactions from industry that this is way too high. I think the answer is yes, it's often way too high, but then when the industry starts working with you, um, you actually work out a pathway to get to that. So the question is, how much do you think innovation yeah. and that collaboration with companies yeah. is going to play a, a role in getting to those outcomes, which, sure. which we all agree on? Yeah, look, great question. And, and I think you, you're right. You have to set the bar high and go for it. I, I think that normally the bar is set as a, as a performance standard to meet, right. not a prescriptive list. Mm -hmm. I think prescriptive list of tick these boxes and you're done is not innovative at all. What you're actually doing is saying, build it like that and you're done. There is no compelling reason for innovation then, because you've described to us the 27 things we have to do. I, I think setting a standard, um, we never think it's too high. If the customer wants that, that's what we'll give the customer. I mean, at the end of the day, it's you guys using the buildings and we love you to have the best thing possible. If you look at the innovation that took place in the education buildings, um, the education classrooms that are built through modular construction these days are superb. They're fantastic. They've got incredible um, efficiencies around sustainability. So we love that. We, we'd like our industry to be innovation, uh, innovative, sorry. But you need the customer driving that and working with us. So I think setting a standard which is more performance-based mm -hmm. will encourage companies like um, our industry to, to drive as, as quickly as we can towards that. Because that actually gives us a competitive advantage. Yeah. And I think you want us to have a competitive competitiveness about us to get there. So, so I think it's very positive. So market demand, innovation, and collaboration? Okay. Absolutely. Um, I think there's a point as well when you ask the question. I'm the general manager for ATCO, so we're right. a, yeah. a similar um, company to OSCO. Mm. The, in five or ten years' time, there's a natural evolution with air conditioning, for instance. Mm. And I know that the proposed standard talks about zero ODPs and that, that essentially means there'd be probably 70 to 80,000 air conditioners in the construction specific site shed fleet around Australia, pretty much throw all them away. They don't comply. Forget the cost for a minute and that's astronomical, you can all do the maths. There's a natural evolution in the, in the when the air conditioners need to be replaced, we obviously replace them with a new one, the new ones are more energy efficient, the new ones are better. In a minute, R32 gas will be in wall mounted units, in split system units. So if no one did anything, there was no regulations, in a couple of years' time, all the air conditioning is zero ODP anyway. Yeah. It's just, it's natural evolution of the product. So, as Anthony says, the, um, the, the, it's not just the cost, it's the practicality of making those changes, particularly in that amount of time, there's probably a billion dollars worth of buildings that people, that the companies have invested in an existing fleet to then go, okay, change it to that. You're probably talking about spending three or four hundred million dollars to change that. So what's the best way of encouraging that change? Um, I'm not too sure, that's a good question. And that's the obvious, that's what's the solution here and how do we get to where we need to go? Please yeah, go on the panel. We, we've thought a lot about that, and an industry association uh, has got together with the major players to, to talk about that. And, and the way we'd like to see that done is it's, it's all in the phasing and, and, and picking the list. So if there's 10 things to do, and eight can be done relatively easy, easily, and they are, most of the things can be done relatively easily to these buildings, existing buildings. I think then having um, a performance standard which we're aiming for for the future which we then know we will design our buildings and our manufacturing to meet those needs in the future with a phase-in is what's required. Because what you're doing is two things. You're, you're showing us that, that you actually do care about the fact that we've got existing buildings in the fleet, both environmentally and financially, which need to be um, sort of moved along. Um, and then also that we, we actually have confidence to invest in something knowing that this is a product of the future. So I think 
If you can get the phasing to a point where we say, okay, well, let's, let's lift the standard as quickly as possible on those, and then let's have a longer term thing on others is, is the one. I think the other one is, is just about us understanding, and this is probably an ACA question, is um, we remain skeptical. And I, I know you say, look, it'd be great to come in a year's time, but we can't afford to wait to see if it's going to be successful. We need to know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think showing a behavioural change at the procurement side of things is what we would need to see where there is a specification required and that's it. But the first thing that will kill you is a project manager on a site going, no, forget about it, doing that. And part of that could be for your members who own their own buildings. What are they going to do? And I think, you know, it's all very well to say we need to do these things, but a strong sign would be us saying, well, how do we as an association help them get their buildings to the same sorts of levels what would be uh, another thing to look at. What Anthony's really saying there is, so you need to, you need to build a new building, it costs $20,000. Okay, now we need the standards to be up here, so that building now costs $30,000. Obviously, there needs to be a return on that investment. So it's not so much having the $30,000 or the $20,000, it's the confidence in the return you're going to get on that product. If then you go to the marketplace and they say, the first site goes, yep, we're happy to pay a higher rate for that building because it's a more valuable building, because it has the sustainability built in. But then the next site, they don't want to pay. The next site, they don't want to pay. That's, the, that's a massive problem. So that, that's why the, the surety that we need to go, yes, this is across the board. The client won't get a choice. They have to meet the standards. All of a sudden, that helps from a commercial perspective on new builds because there's no choice. Everyone has to do it. That's, that's the key to that, and the, the points that Anthony and Darren were making about the existing fleet, that can be dealt with separately. Yeah, yeah I was just gonna make a point there, Ian. So um, we, we hear that a lot as customers trying to hire these, these sheds, is that um, you know, we, we're asking for features that if, we were, if you were to build in, you'd have to ask, charge more money for, and there are the other products that are a lower standard that you'll, you'll be stuck with this kind of um, one that's been upgraded. And I guess that is a challenge, I think, back to, the, to, to our suppliers around, certainly when we're engaging with our sites, we are looking at a level of quality that we absolutely need and expect for our paid employees in site offices where we want a good quality product. Like the salaries we are paying for these guys, mm -hmm. like it is completely in our interest to have good quality accommodation. Sure, there are lunch rooms for um, construction workers that are coming out and using them for 15 minutes on the smoko, 45 minutes at lunch, going back out. You know, they can be a different standard. And I think that is the challenge that we don't see necessarily as customers is, you know, what is the office standard versus the lunchroom standard? Because I think what you're seeing is in order to maintain your, your, your fleet, they're all the lunchrooms that could maybe be made into an office if you knocked out a wall, but let's just keep them as lunchrooms because tomorrow they'll have to be lunchrooms again. And I think that's where we, we need to perhaps create a demand as an industry to say, no, we want a product that we pay salaried people in to be of a high quality, and we need a product that is lunch lunchrooms, 15 minutes, doesn't really matter, who, you know, who cares, um, and, and have suppliers that are willing to, to give us those two kind of quality points. It, it does make, it, it is easier to make sense of it when you're talking about office complexes like this one, mm -hmm. the split system air conditioning. So it's easier to make sense of that from an office complex perspective because typically the use of those is in a professional office environment mm -hmm. where a 12 by 3 or a 6 by 3 lunchroom or an office, it's kind of a little bit different. Yeah. Bear in mind there's still it's not as if there's no insulation or there's no air conditioning or anything like that. It's in still, those lunchrooms, no, they're, yeah, they're the, still, they're the, not, yeah, they're the, still. There's still yeah. is high standards there which are evolving all the time as yeah. well. Yeah. So it's not so much, and it's not really feasible to have two standards of fleet. I think, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but in the UK went through a similar process in the modular building industry uh, several years ago. And it's okay, here's the new standard, here's the new standards. Some people then went, okay, they've invested millions of dollars in, we've got a sustainably, suitable fleet and a little while later the market kind of shifted and went yeah we can't afford any of that it was a disaster it ruined the industry in the uk and actually it, it all went backwards from there so as anthony has pointed out we're 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 happy to journey forward and we want the standards to be higher but 
We just need a surety in that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense commercially. And that would be from... But just, just to pick up, we haven't considered your, your point you've just raised about different standards for different applications. The way this comes out, it feels to us like it's every building that's on a site. So, so even just getting clarity in that conversation through a collaboration process, I think would, would be good. I think that the, the procurement, the yeah. innovation, the collaboration part is, yeah. is yet to unfold quite yeah. a bit. What I'd be keen to do is, is now get to, I guess, the, the client perspective uh, and the next two presentations. Please would you join me in thanking uh, both Darren and Anthony.